Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Eric Lopatin, um, I'm product manager at PLOS. And um, can everybody hear me OK? All right. Uh, one thing about hearing that I should tell you is that I wear hearing aids. Uh, so when folks come up for questions later, please don't hesitate to enunciate. Don't be shy, that kind of thing. Uh, the sound in this room is really good, so I'm not worried about it, but just to let you know. Um, so I'm here to tell you about a particular project that we took on at PLOS recently. Uh, it was a really fun project where we got to experiment with one of our own applications and then communicate the results of those experiments to the entire organization using Jupyter Notebooks so folks could actually dig in and take a look at the data that we uh, turned up from our work. So what was the problem that we wanted to tackle? So um, at PLOS, with PLOS One, we have um, this automated solution for actually trying to assign incoming manuscripts for PLOS One to somebody on, an edit on our editorial board. Um, we have to do that at scale, and that uh, essentially means that uh, we're working with about 7,500 academic editors, and we have about 100 papers a day that come in. Uh, so within uh, each day, we have to essentially create queues of uh, invitations for these editors, and we have to send them out um, on a regular basis. The, as you can imagine, uh, the composition of the academic editor board uh, also changes all the time. So we have, um, we have profiles for each of the editors. Uh, we have information about the papers they've edited, the papers that they've authored. And we have a whole series of notes about them that also change uh, over the course of time. Folks are being onboarded. Uh, folks are also offboarding. So all of that makes for a dynamic environment. And you know, the, the real problem here, or the real challenge, was how do we actually improve, sorry about that, improve the uh, invitation quality that we have. Uh, we definitely want to keep our academic editors happy on the board. Uh, we want to make sure we're not spending, sending them too much spam, uh, which you know, we, we send lots of invitations. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we sent over 700,000 invitations for our manuscripts, and uh, mm, that was out of control. So um, <clears throat> this, uh, this application uh, has actually been around for a few years, and um, you know, our job was to get into the application, relearn it, because a lot of the original development team was no longer with us. Um, and here was our approach for this whole project. Um, what we needed to do first was reach out to the ed board uh, and send them a survey that uh, essentially enabled them to tell us, you know, how are, are our invitations faring right now? Um, <clears throat> you know, can you give us some feedback on those invitations? Uh, we're going to keep that information uh, from the academic editors as our kind of gold standard data. So that's human input into this equation. Um, then we developed um, an analysis framework that uh, essentially is all built on Python uh, and uh, use a lot of open source tools that we'll, I'll call out in a couple minutes. Um, and we used um, essentially uh, the evaluation of binary classifiers to find out whether or not um, the results of our changes were good or bad. Um, then we tested a whole variety of like algorithm and index changes on the application. Um, and when we put together the Jupyter Notebooks, we were posting those like on a daily basis, essentially, for the entire organization so they could go into the notebooks and drill, in, drill down and take a look at all the information that was there, um, which worked really, really well. This is, this is actually the first time we used Jupyter Notebooks in a project uh, to communicate that type of information. Uh, so the, a little bit about the editorial board survey. Uh, we sent uh, the survey out to the entire ed board. They could, you know, tell us on a scale of one to five, was this a good, bad, or a good invitation or a bad invitation? Um, bad was one, five was great. Uh, we had about 1,000 uh, editors respond to us, which was a really great response. Uh, we had about 5,000 manuscripts that they commented on uh, over the course of a, a few weeks. Um, and we got about 11,000 data points out of that. Um, again, the, the answers that they gave us were our gold standard that we worked with. And then to actually make use of that, um, here's a little bit about the uh, tools that we used for the analysis framework. So we used pandas and numpy and scikit-learn. 
Um, and you know, the, the, like for example, Scikit-Learn so gave us the ability to introduce these classifiers and um, the actual metrics that we were pulling from the experiments um, so we could take a look at them. Um, and if you were in the last session, I have a feeling this slide is irrelevant, but um, for folks who are not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks yet, uh, they're a really great tool. It's, you know, they're an open source uh, web application. They, they allow you to put it, uh, you know, into one concentric form. Uh, they allow you to write a narrative. They allow you to run your code in a variety of different uh, languages and to actually give the folks who are looking at your Jupyter Notebooks the opportunity to adjust that code or add you know, arguments uh, or change things so they can actually see the data in front of them change. Um, and here's just a quick snapshot of one of the notebooks, uh, one section of our notebooks. And I have a, a, a server running on this laptop here, so we'll take a look at the actual notebooks in a few. Um, so the evaluation of binary classifiers, um, really the binary classification we're talking about here, comparing two methods um, of assigning a, a binary attribute, that attribute was, of course, was this invitation good or bad. Um, the, you know, for the two methods that we're you know, testing at hand here, essentially we have the application that's trying to figure out who should I send this manuscript to? Uh, and then we also have the edboard uh, who told us, well, that's who you should send it to because that's a good match. Um, to help visualize uh, essentially what these things are doing, uh, we can use something called a confusion matrix. And here's where, yeah, it'll be helpful to actually have a little pointer. Um, so you can see on, say, the uh, left edge there, the ed board. So that's the actual data. That's the information, the response from the ed board. That's our gold standard. Uh, so when they tell us that's a positive match and that's a good thing, uh, that to us is the, the key item there. Uh, the prediction is the app, um, and so that's against the application trying to figure out whether or not the incoming manuscript based on its content uh, is good for this particular editor based on their profile data. Um, so when we start filling this out, uh, keeping in mind, so this is, this is a true positive, so that means that when the actual application agrees with what the editors say, uh, that is a true positive, that's what we want to see. Um, we also would want to see a true negative. So this is when they um, agree that an invitation is a bad thing. Um, so, you know, uh, the application would not send an actual invitation in this case because there was not enough inf agreement between the manuscript uh, and the editor's profile. Um, where it gets a little bit different to, uh, to think about these things, and we have a false positive down here. Um, that's when the actual, when the application says, you know what, I think this is a great invitation. But the editor said, mm, no, you're wrong. Uh, so that's a false positive. You can consider that spam. So we, you know, we want to reduce the amount of spam we're sending. Um, we definitely want to reduce the number of false positives that we have. Uh, and then up in the other corner, um, in the false negatives, uh, this, is, this is like a missed opportunity again. This is kind of like, well, it was a good match, but the application thought it was not a good match. We never sent an invitation, and we lost out. Uh, the actual classifiers that we were putting to use, um, there were, are a range of them, and the one we ended up actually paying attention to most is called precision. Um, so it's really easy to calculate. It's basically the, uh, the total number of true positives between uh, the, the agreements between the, uh, the ed board and the application uh, over the true positives and false positives that are actually collected during an experiment. Okay, so uh, let's go take a look at one of our notebooks and we can kind of work our way back toward these classifiers so you can see them all listed out. And um, so what I've done is I've basically opened up this notebook several times in several tabs so I don't have to like go all over the place. Um, this is our, the very beginning of the notebook um, and this particular one you'll notice up at the top um, I don't have my fancy like red dot anymore. Uh, it's talking about BM25 analysis, and this is part of our narrative at the very beginning uh, of the notebook. And BM25, this is essentially um, another uh, relevance ranking algorithm that we're trying to introduce in the application. So what that does is, um, in a typical search application, this is not machine learning enabled. This is actually using uh, what's called TFIDF, or term frequency and inverse document frequency. Um, but what it does is when it sees an incoming manuscript, 
it's going to take a look at what it considers all the key terms in that particular manuscript. And the way it finds out that those are key terms is it actually goes through every single document in the index, so thousands of documents in the index, and it tries to find which terms don't appear that much there but still match the incoming manuscript. So, um, for example, if the word cell, uh, which appears in you know, thousands and thousands of times in lots of documents across our corpus, uh, appeared in this particular incoming manuscript, cell would not be considered a very important word. Um, on the other hand, um, I don't know if you say velociraptor, you say something that's like, uh, we have a lot of paleontology articles, but velociraptor is still not that common. Um, you know, and so we consider that a, a somewhat more special word. Um, so BM25 is another way of assigning a relevance ranking score to each individual word that's considered a key term in the incoming manuscript. And we'll take a look at those scores in a minute. Okay, uh, that's not exactly what I wanted to have happen, but that's okay. Um, so you'll see here at the very beginning of the notebook, um, we have uh, what's going here's the incoming manuscript just by an actual key. Uh, then we have uh, a series of editors that were suggested for this particular match. And um, they're just also by ID. But here's the top editor match. So every time a manuscript comes in, this application will give you up to 50 different editors that might actually match that manuscript that might be a good person to send an invite to. Um, and then here's the relevance ranking score that I was talking about. So, this particular um, person at the very top of the queue has a relevance ranking score of 574 points. Um, and if you wanted to actually see additional folks in this queue, I could go ahead and um, just type in a different argument, like the default here for this particular uh, function is just five folks from the very top of the queue. I could type in 20 and then uh, rerun this cell and essentially get another 15 people that would show up there. You could see the next folks in line that were particularly going to or that were going to be assigned to the manuscript or sent invitations. Um, I will not do that right now because this particular notebook is looking for a branch of software on a server back in San Francisco that is not running right now. Uh, so if I do that, the notebook will kind of freak out, uh, and I don't want to have that happen in front of everybody. Um, the next little section of the notebook uh, is actually really, really neat. Um, so if you recall, actually, take a look here. This particular editor is 95676. This editor here is also called out in this uh, cell as the editor, and a manuscript is right next to it by ID, which was the incoming manuscript. And you can see by looking through this entire cell that here are all the key terms that the application was able to surface uh, when it tried to make this match. So um, as a member of, uh, of the staff who are trying to figure out, you know, why was this, inv this editor invited to this manuscript? Um, and which key terms in the manuscript were really important? Well, now you can go down here and take a look at the documents that were in the editor's profile that also have those words. And you can see if there are any outliers or any odd things that are there. So when folks write into us and say, hey, why was I ever sent this invitation? This is uh, not what I want. Um, we, could, uh, we could go back through here and surface these raw terms and essentially tell them, oh, there's an outlier. Maybe this is why you got this invitation, because that shows up in your, your notes for your profile. Um, this, particular uh, part of the notebook ended up being a feature request from our editorial staff, so we're now going to build the, um, that particular feature into the, the UI for the application so they can actually um, address some of our editor's questions. Um, in the next section, um, this is really interesting also because uh, you'll see here is the Here's the, the manuscript again on the side here. Um, and we were talking about true positives and um, true negatives and false positives and false negatives. Um, those were when the application agreed or didn't agree uh, with the actual editorial board survey. So uh, unfortunately, it's not a great label. But this is a labeled source is matched. That basically, to us, means that this is when the editorial staff, it's a known data point, told us that, nope, this is not a good uh, match or yes is a good match. So in this case, yes, this was a good match according to the editorial board. Uh, then all the way on the right-hand side, which is what the application thought, 
Uh, it said, no, I don't think that's a good match. And um, right, so that was actually a missed opportunity. So we really should have sent an invitation to that particular editor. Um, and you can go through here. Again, it's like one of those things where if you want to see more potential um, keys, then you can find out um, who those people were. You can generate more. Um, so a little bit farther down on the note, the notebook, we're back to our narrative, and here's uh, kind of an abbreviated version of that confusion matrix. Uh, and again, here we're explaining the whole like AE matches match part. Um, sorry, I just activated that cell, and here's the actual, all the, we could edit this if we wanted to. Um, so we talk a little bit about the classifiers, uh, and then we give a link to the place in Wikipedia page where you can go and read up uh, about all of those. Um, and um, Right, so uh, the developer who worked on this uh, has a good sense of humor, and at one point he was saying in there, uh, if, if you don't want to actually like, read up on all these, basically higher numbers are better. Um, so here are all the different classifiers, and here's the actual BM25 algorithm, and uh, right here, the classifier result, and here's precision versus uh, this little section up here, a uh, little higher up, this is the baseline what was in production right now. And you'll see that this precision for the production algorithm was 0.5. The precision for this algorithm change was 0.52. Um, so it was you know, a small but significant bump that, that was there that we were able to say, OK, well, BM25, you know, at least in one configuration, might be a good relevance ranking function to introduce. Um, so the the way the whole project ran is that we made these little cumulative changes, um, and we were able to figure out which ones were duds, when they were definitely duds, uh, versus which ones were good. And in the last section of the notebook that I want to show you, this is where we actually compared some of our experiments. And pardon the scrolling. Uh, here we have each of the different um, changes that we ended up making. So way down at the bottom, um, these are a combination of three different changes that we made, uh, including introducing more key terms. We changed the algorithm a little bit. Uh, and then we did some word stemming. So um, I don't know if anybody noticed, but when we were looking at those, those terms, uh, in the, like earlier, uh, that were the, the actual terms in the um, manuscripts right here, uh, we have nodes and node. And we're, at this point, considering both of those words as individual words, which we definitely should not be doing. So you know, node should be the only thing we should pay attention to. Uh, we introduced word stemming, which essentially looks for the root of the particular word and just clings to that and says, that's what, you're really, that's what you should be interested in. Um, so back to the final uh, section here, right? So we can see that a combination of all of these actually gave us almost a 10% bump. And um, we want to find out how this actually worked in the real world. We ran an A-B test. And um, we can see that uh, down here, this is another Jupyter notebook that we created for this A-B test. Uh, that we have a, an 83% acceptance rate for the manuscripts that were in the test cohort going through versus a 78% acceptance rate um, for the control. And I can go back through these graphs if folks have questions about them later. These are uh, essentially, like for example, uh, the median number of invitations that we had to send before somebody picked something up. We graphed those out. Um, but if I go all the way down to the bottom of this page, um, if we ran this through an A-B test calculator, you can see that our p-value is 0 0.0001. So we can be almost entirely sure that what we're seeing here was um, the cause for was caused by our actual experiment and the changes we made to the application. Um, and the 30% um, like conversion rate essentially tells us that uh, you know about instead of sending three bad invitations, you know, one out of those three, we might not actually send that one anymore because of the improvements that we made to the application. So um, that was pretty much information that we kind of plugged in to this calculator. It was really useful. Um, and I only have a very short amount of time left. Um, the reason we built this analysis framework really um, is because if we want to engage with other folks in, in the future, um, you know, we could actually use the same binary classifier approach 
by judging a proof of concept from another organization or by building one ourselves. We could still use this framework. Um, and finally, uh, you know, that's kind of where we're headed right now. To that, to that end, we've essentially like wrapped up all of our data in a nice neat package uh, so we can use that as training data for uh, um, machine learning enabled uh, application if we decide to go that direction. Um, and you know, that has the training data is essentially the corpus. Uh, and then we have test data, which is the labeled data from the academic editors. And we also establish like the relationship between something in the corpus versus an editor. Did they, you know, did they author that? Did they edit that or handle it? That kind of thing. Um, and yeah, so in the future, I think we're, we're kind of at a crossroads right now. We're actually about to release these changes into production, like full on for all the manuscripts for PLOS One next week. So I'm biting my fingernails. Uh, <laughs> but. But I think it'll be all right. Um, and yeah, I, again, I guess we'll, uh, you know, we're at a crossroads. We'll see what happens next. So, thank you. Um, anybody have any questions? Um. I'll ask the obvious one because I didn't. I don't think I saw this. Are you making any of your notebooks um, available to the community? Uh, we have not thought about doing that yet, um, but it, it would be interesting to do it. We have actually um, anonymized the data in the notebooks, so we could post these things. Um, you know, we're trying to kind of like follow the GDPR path, right? Yeah. So um, and when we made that data set, we actually anonymized all of the editors and their contact information. So yeah, it would be, it would be neat to post. So. Yeah, I, I mean, personally, I think it would be really interesting to see a notebook even without the data to kind of see how your process might um, uh, inform processes that might go forward in other journals as well. Right, so. right. It, yeah, it's, it would be, it, it's really, a, a, again, the person who dove into this, um, who was the main developer on the notebooks, uh, was, was exploring and, and found this kind of binary classifier evaluation approach, which is really, really, it's applicable to a lot of different things, so yeah. Uh, anybody else? Could we have like, Six or seven minutes. That's good. Yeah. So uh, I have one question. Like uh, you were, you told you were using the TF-IDF approach mm -hmm. uh, for this uh, matching thing. For right? I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, for that, you are using the TF-IDF uh, approach. So uh, right now we have more, much more sophisticated uh, semantic approaches to address this kind of things like word vectors or something. So uh, are, are you also thinking to port this to those uh, 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 semantic uh, kind of thing rather than going by the lexical level? Because you know lexical approaches has got very uh, much much limitations when we consider a huge amount of data. So. So, so um, uh, unfortunately, I'm missing a lot of what you're saying, but you're, you're enunciating very well. Thank you. So, so you're talking about uh, like in terms of like concept extraction as opposed to like individual word ex extraction. As, uh, and I, I am talking about that representation of the uh, of, of the um, uh, of the documents or something in, hmm. in terms of vectors. So you are using TFID vectors, right? To the rep actual rep like the full text documentation. Right. Document. Right, right, yeah. yeah. So in s it's instead of that, uh, there are many in a sophisticated NLP approaches nowadays, like word vectors, globe vectors. So I guess, uh, are you planning to port those things to uh, your domain? Like, you, you have got a huge amount of articles in your journal, so maybe you can create the semantic representation of those and uh, take those into account for much more better uh, manuscript yeah. or uh, editor right. matching because uh, semantics do play a role while yeah. Edit, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the things we would love to do is build a topic model of the entire like PLOS corpus um, so we could actually achieve some of the similarity based on concepts. Um, and we could, we could also, um, the, the idea that we have our own taxonomy, and there are about mm, thousands of terms, like 10,000 some odd terms that have all been like human curated. If we could actually merge like the topic model for, for um, you know, the, the uh, corpus to the taxonomy and see how those things panned out that way, that would be really useful for us. Um, but that taxon taxonomy is also like open source, so if we actually had like the, um, 
the topic model uh, a public thing as well, then then folks could actually see how those things intermingle. But but yeah, I think you know ideally we would like to see concept extraction and better modeling that way um, because you know here we're dealing with individual words, a hundred different words in a document. If you can extract concepts um, and then you can think about like what are those methods that are that people are using in this particular research. Uh, what are the more complex topics that we can actually pick up from those manuscripts in order to match those to the editor in our editor board? Um, yeah, I'd love to do that. Yeah. And, and maybe you would like to have a look on the Toronto paper matching system. To Toronto paper matching system. So it's already in the run. So via which the uh, papers are actually matched to the reviewer profiles and they are being sent. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Um, my gosh. Uh, <sighs> That the entire reviewer like matching um, is, is really difficult for us. Um, you know, we have we have, of course, lots of connections to reviewers, but um, I I'm not sure. Like we could apply some of this methodology to the matching reviewers. Um, I would rather uh, see uh, see us apply the same kind of like topic modeling or you know machine learning enabled technology for doing that, just to get a better snapshot of what how each of the reviewers could assist with a particular manuscript, um, even make suggestions to academic editors that are on a particular manuscript who need to find new reviewers that way would be awesome. Um, but yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for repeating and enunciating. I'm sorry. To move to the next session. Okay. Thank you very much.